Do your 10,000 hours, you know, like they say, because society now is moving really quickly and this instant gratification that, that people feel like, I want this and now we can look it up and get it. Learn your instrument, you know, and learn if it's, if it's producing and study, you know, productions and who did producing and, and do some tracks. George, thanks for joining us. This is exciting. There is a scene happening here in Miami. You know, I kind of knew about it from a lot of different plays. I graduated, you know, Miami University, but there's a much larger scene going on down here that I believe the U.S., the nation, and the world don't really know about us. And listen, you're one of these guys hmm. that's right at the forefront of all this. So thanks for joining us. No, absolutely. It's a pleasure. Thank you for, thanks for having me. You are involved with so many people. You're Productions, your publishing company. Tell me about the beginning of music for you. The beginning of music. I started out in, in rock bands. My my first love was classic rock. You know, I started with the Stones and the Beatles and Zeppelin and Pink Floyd and the Who, and that was that was first caught my ear. And ironically, it was I was at a Miami Dolphins game the night John Lennon got shot. Mm. And at the time. It didn't strike me that much. I didn't really know who he was. I knew the Beatles, and oh, that's too bad, you know, but it didn't really strike me. The next few days, I see these images of the Beatles on TV. I said, what is that? And it just hooked me like it's just strong, cool. just in a way that changed my life. It, it put me on a path. I got, let me get a guitar, Mom, Dad, I want a guitar. I got I to gotta do that, you know. So I was never the same after that. That was the beginning for me. And then I just started playing in rock bands, and first in South Florida, and then I went to University of Florida. So you playing guitar? Yeah, playing and guitar singing. and singing. Yeah. Well, actually, first started as a drummer. Fantastic. That was my first <laughs> instrument. I have, to, I have to remember that. And then I got the guitar. Yeah. Yeah, but that first, the rhythm was the first thing that got me. So you're playing with these bands, you're starting to work professionally with some of these bands? First it was the open mics and that, and you know, it was, little seedy places and and it was a good experience so you get your first kind of view of wow this is a little rough and then and, you know you get the, that life a little bit but University of Florida we started playing uh, professionally we get house gigs start doing covers you know a week at a time yeah. then we started doing uh, up and down Florida kind of the house band a week at a time staying in the band houses which was oof was rough. And there were many, <laughs> but there were many clubs like that to be able to do that. Yeah, so it was yeah, a, it was at the time, scene. there was a lot of hair bands at the time, in the 80s, late yeah, 80s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we didn't really, we were more classic rock. We did, we kind of, ah, we're not doing that, but, yeah. but it was, it was a good scene for cover bands. There was a lot of places to play at yeah. the time, all the way from the Keys, all the way up to Gainesville. And then we went up the southeast of the uh, United States as well. And then eventually we worked with Eric Schilling, who was Gloria Stefan's mixer and yeah. manager of her studio for many years, yeah, still yeah. is an amazing legend in the industry. Yeah. Mixes the Grammys, broadcasts every year still to this day. Yeah. And, and he gave us our first break and he really mentored us and we got to go into Criteria, recorded three songs, our original songs. So he heard you performing? Yeah. And he asked you, we gotta lay some of this up down. Yeah, yeah, so we started writing our own songs okay. and, then we, and then we showed him some of the originals. And, yeah. and, so he, you know, he took to us and, and, and we, you know, we were blessed to have him guide us through that, that first, you know, time in our big studio. Criteria, Absolutely. Studio C with Bob Marley and <laughs> Layla and Derek and the Dominoes. We were, oh my gosh, we're in Studio C. <laughs> and actually I was interning. He asked me, well, while we're recording, do you want to intern at Crescent Moon at, at Gloria and Emilio studio? I said, of course, I'll make lunch and I'll get coffee and I'll just watch. I would make records. They're yeah. making real records. And it was a great experience, you know? And then imagine five years later, I think six years later, I was in Gloria's band. Came back and after I went to University of Miami, came back, I was in Gloria's band. So you went to University of Miami at that time mm -hmm. and your major was? Jazz vocal. Jazz vocals, right, right. Yeah, I mean, I, I really wanted to do more production and songwriting, but they didn't really have that program at that time. Yeah. So that was the closest thing I could find was a jazz, jazz major and I was, more of a singer than guitar player or anything else. I played a little bit of everything, you know, a little piano, a little guitar, but I, I couldn't compete with those guys at UM. Who were some of your vocal influences? A lot of the classic rock guys. That's what I really, you know, I watched, I remember recording this, I think it was on TV, it was back in the day when cable, you had this pay-per-view on TV, 
Stones concert, Rolling Stones. <laughs> and I watched that every day after school. I'd watch two or three songs every day, every day, and just watch Mick and how he sings. And then even Keith, the way he sang, it was yeah. like, oh, he's got a great voice, but he's got this, the way he emotes, you know, oh, communicates. He delivers it so well. And I would pick up these things, and the Beatles, you know, yeah. and John and Paul's harmonies, you know, I was really into the harmonies. Those were my, my first influences in, in vocally. How fantastic. Isn't it amazing the influence the Beatles have had? I mean, I have yeah. sat across some of the finest musicians in the world, yeah. and the thread of all the inspiration yeah. and influences comes in what the Beatles have done in their music and how they played, how they yeah. played, how they sang, their harmonies, right. the writing, so many aspects. Right. And amazing. all the different genres. People yeah. will say, you know, these heavy metal bands or, you know, jazz or anything. Oh, the Beatles, the Beatles. <laughs> they all come back to the Beatles. It was incredible. I got to meet Paul. Really? Twice, yeah. I have a, a friends in his band, uh, Rusty Anderson and, and Abe Laboriel, I'm sure yeah, you know. Yeah, sure, sure. And great guys, and, and we got to meet him a couple of times, and he was everything I'd hoped for. He was humble. You hungry? You want some food? We got food, you know. <laughs> With the Liverpool accent. It's the Liverpool accent, it's Paul. <laughs> And he's super, super sweet and, yeah. and accommodating and, and really nice. So, it's so think about that. Here you are from Miami. You go to school, you're learning, you're influenced by the Beatles, you meet Paul. I mean, this is yeah. really a, a stepping stone of greatness that you're yeah. involved with. You gotta really pinch yourself sometimes. Yes. It's hard to believe and it's such a blessing. And I've learned from so many people and so many people have come along and helped and given me an opportunity or shown me, you know, how to do this or when I got in Gloria's band, all these musicians, I would learn, pick their brains on the rhythms, and it's just amazing. So I think what, what you guys are doing here is incredible to give back and continue that, hey, this is how these guys did it, and maybe you can grab little pieces and, and make your own path, but Absolutely. it's great and, and to listen, pass it on. What you've done, I mean, you know, the owner of the Cutting Cane Productions, Cutting Cane Publishing, you started to get involved in more of the business side, so you saw not only the performance side, right. but the business side became important. How did you develop that? Getting into Gloria's band, Gloria Stefan, and, and watching Emilio, her husband, as, as a producer, you know, we, he had a, a stable of like 30, 30 40 writer producers. Yeah. And it was, it was our own little Latin Motown, we called it, because yeah. it was at the time when there was a lot of crossover happening from Spanish to English, and a lot of Latin artists singing in English. It was Ricky Martin, Shakira, J-Lo, yeah, yeah. Mark Anthony, all, and yeah. it was right at that time when we were there. So we were there at the, at the perfect time. And just watching him take a project from A to Z, you know, it was from the songs, you know, first bringing the artist and showing him the songs and then finding a sound for the project and the right producer and the right musicians and the engineers and who's going to mix it. And I was, wow, you know, because I'd come from the world of just performing and doing some studio work. So I really took to that and, and I enjoyed that process of having that vision for a project yeah. and putting all the pieces together and, and watching all these, you know, watching it all come together if you do it right. It's not easy, but, and knowing all these great musicians here in Miami was, was a blessing. And we all used each other on the, yeah, hey, yeah. come sing on this, oh great, come sing. So that energy there was great. There really is an incredible family of musicians yes. here in Miami that really is close-knit. Yeah the tight, phenomenal players. I've had the chance to yeah. interview many of them here. It, what was it like to balance being on stage and performing and then being back behind the board or producing and mixing? How, how, how do you balance that too? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a different animal and also the studio is a different animal. Yeah, you yeah. know, And you see that whole process of, of the recording and then watching it come to life at a live show. Yeah. And you know, trying to keep all that in mind because it's all part of the, of the big picture I mean, in terms of the studio, it's, it's you know, very controlled and, 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 and you can have magic that's spontaneous, but it's a controlled atmosphere. And then yeah. the live show is it's just, what's going to happen? <laughs> what's next? Who knows? I don't know. So they, they're both exciting in their own way. So with all the different artists that you're playing with and, and your experience, I mean, like you mentioned, Ricky Martin, Shakira and Jennifer, what was it like, what was it like working with them? in their perspective of how they saw music? Did you have to adapt to what they were doing? Did you um, guide them along the way? What was it? My approach uh, to, to production, I would say a lot of time, well, you, always, I think, is, is more artist-centered. I think there's some producers that have their own sound and, and artists come to them for that sound, which right. I think is amazing. Yeah, yeah. But I've just naturally felt that I'm, I more serve the artist and the song mm. 
and, 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 and kind of approach it that way. So at that time, there were, they were crossing over a lot of times. In a lot of cases, they were singing in English for the first time. So, you know, could help that way. Doing, you know, Shakira came from Columbia, was her first English album. Ricky was the first English album. Yeah. Uh, Mark Anthony was the first English album. I didn't, I didn't produce Mark at that time, but that was the trend. So we were finding a fusion, you know, finding our way of, you know, these influences, at least for me, this classic rock influence and all this with this Latin world. And this guy who's kind of like, in Ricky's case, a, a Latin Elvis yeah. kind of guy. Absolutely. We kind of approached it that way. Obviously, it was a new thing. It wasn't Elvis, but it was that type of, of incredible entertainer. And how do you, what vehicle do, can we create for him to just deliver that, you know? And we wrote one song that was, uh, shake your bone bone, shake your bone bone, shake your bone. It was very, very Elvis, you know? <laughs> and I uh, wrote that with Draco Rosa, who's an incredible incredible writer he wrote La Vida Loca for Ricky too yeah with yeah. Desmond Child and yeah, yeah. that kind of kicked it off that was big. and then there was other the other songs that came after it I wrote the following single with John Sakata, who you're gonna interview yeah uh, called She's All I Ever Had and there was a beautiful ballad that we wrote for Ricky that followed up La Vida Loca and you know John still performs it in his concert and so does Ricky How to this day it's a, it was a blessing where does writing come from How, what, what, what inspires that it's a, a mystery, you know, and I think that's part of what, what makes it exciting and beautiful is it's, you never know where it's, where it's going to come from, and sometimes you try and try. It's okay, but it's not great, I don't, or this sounds like that, I'm doing the same thing I did, uh, and then all of a sudden you're like in the shower or you're eating dinner, and you're like, I got, I got an idea, and you get the <laughs> phone, I got to record it, you know, in the middle of the night, and then you wake up the next day, and it's uh, it makes no sense. I swear it was a great song happening in my brain. It was a hit. I know it. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a beautiful experience, uh, you know, because it's, it is a mystery. And, and when you co-write with new people, everybody has their musical journey and their path. And they bring something different. Oh, I would have never thought about that. And, you know, I would have tried this, you know, but that's interesting. And then you kind of push and pull, you know, and then you come out with something. And sometimes it's a right mix. Boy, the makes some magic. That, yeah, the combination that you have is amazing. Was there, a, was there a mentor in your life, or did you have mentors that kind of, you know, you looked up to and you focused on them and guided yourself? Yeah, I mean, there, light, there were a lot of people that I looked up to that, that really took my hand and, and, and lifted me to the next level of knowledge. And people like Ed Kaye, who's an amazing sax player here in Miami. Rita Quintero, who was a singer, who, who took me into doing studio sessions while I was in U University of Miami, who eventually took me into Gloria's band. She was kind of the, the person that, that took me in there. But I think in terms of where I ended up in, in my career was probably Emilio Stefan. Mm. Being with him, like I said, watching him take these artists from A to Z and these projects from A to Z. And he really took us all, you know, the 30 or 40 of us under his wing. and. He was like our Barry Gordy, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, and it was a great time to be there because it was this fusion of, of both Anglo and, and Latin worlds and, and doing this, this music that really had never been done, yeah. you know, it was, it was, and we were doing it in a new way, you know, yeah. and, and took the, the, the baton from them, you know, the way they started with conga and rhythm is going to get you. I mean, those songs were... 80s pop with this huge with this feel that conga was, rhythm you know absolutely. and they tell the story of how it was people thought they were crazy yeah. you know they went to station after radio station and, ah you're crazy this what is that yeah. it's not pop you know yeah, yeah. and when the people heard it the people spoke <laughs> <laughs> loud and clear for sure that's it what is it i mean Amelia is a brilliant brilliant you know person a musician i always hear yeah. about him what, what, what do you think he has that is that is so special what does he do that he finds the exact key to unlock the yeah. doors. Yeah, I think, I think he understands people and, 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 what, and what they're looking for and what will work and what, you know, from a musical standpoint and also a marketing standpoint. But I think one of the things I noticed from him is that he's always trying to find the next, the next thing. You know, he's not wanting to do conga again. He's not wanting, yeah. he was always pushing forward, it yeah. yeah what's next what's the next thing you know how can we fuse this thing what's happening now oh that's happening let's let's try and make it like this for this artist we do it this way and he was a visionary that could 
really set the path, you know, like the captain of a ship, say, okay, yeah. this is where it's going. <laughs> and everybody come on board and we all, <laughs> and he knew who to surround himself with. He knew he needed some talented people to help him do it. It's amazing the talent that is around yeah. that machine. Yeah, so that's probably yeah. one of his great talents is saying, that guy's good. Yeah. I need him. That's, he can do this for me and that this guy with this guy will make a great yeah. track. You know, let's, yeah. let's try that. So he was great at that. Too. Yeah, there's a certain brilliance in that that really is yeah. really magical. Yeah. Now you're doing some things that I know are huge in Latin America. Tell me about what you're doing mm -hmm. now that's, that's starting to come here to the States too. Yeah, yeah, there's a movement that started, uh, I would say in the 90s called reggaeton. And it's a certain beat, it's a certain feel, it's a rapping, you know, over this certain dembo beat. And it's evolved to the point now where maybe, I would say, five, six, seven years ago, it's, it's gotten into the mainstream of Latin music. Right. And now it's, it's really global. It's global, even in, in non-Spanish-speaking countries, Germany, Sweden, <laughs> Italy, France. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. And if you look at the global charts on, on Spotify, You'll see it's, it's competing there with some of the, you know, Ed Sheeran, and then you'll see the reggaeton, Daddy Yankee. Or, I'm working now to, to fuse a little bit like, you know, we did before, you know, yeah. 20 years ago. Yeah, yeah. But in a new way, fusing this reggaeton with pop, and it's branching out. Now there's getting different, different fusions are forming, like Despacito, which was this phenomenon of Luis Fonsi, an amazing uh, Latin pop singer, and, and then uh, Daddy Yankee. And then Justin Bieber came in and just yeah. took it through the roof. So now the Anglo acts are, are kind of saying, hey, what's that? I want, I want some of that. Yeah. That's, that's, <laughs> you know? And it's different. And it's just a, it's, it's an infectious beat and, and, and energy that's evolving now into, into more pop in different areas, which is great. So I did this song, Calma, with Pedro Capo and Farruko. <laughs> Farruko's the reggaeton guy, the rapper, who's, who's really talented, amazing, and, and Pedro Capo is a singer-songwriter who's, you know, done a few albums, was great success in Puerto Rico, but it was kind of more just in Puerto Rico, and now this song just kind of catapulted him, and it's got like 1.5 billion views on it's YouTube. Unbelievable. And it, it's been this phenomenon that's it's really beautiful, because it's, it's the kind of song you see the grandmothers are singing, the little kids are singing, it's just a very kind of all-inclusive, inclusive type song. But some of the songs, not only got one billion, they've got one billion, five billion. Yeah. They've got some serious momentum yeah. behind this. Yeah. Where do you think reggaeton started? How 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 did it begin? What was the? How would you trace it back? Yeah, I think it's it's from the street, kind of like rap started here. Yeah, you know, it's it's from the neighborhoods, and it, and it was, it was created, uh, you know, on, on inexpensive, you know, beat machines and yeah. fruity loops, you know, that you can get pretty cheap. And these guys rapping. If you can get a laptop and a mic, that's it. And you make a record. You know, what a different back time. in the old days, you had yeah. to, who, who could run that, that 24 track machine? You had to know what you're doing. You had a guy for that. You needed a studio. You can't just do it in your living room. You know? yeah. And the producer and the arranger, you had to, you need musicians. Yeah. <laughs> now, you know, poor musicians are like, eh, man, you know, we need to play because you can press a button and get a beat, press this and play a bass, you know, play strings over here. And one guy can do it all. Mm. So, you know, it's not great for musicians, but, you know, times are, times are changing and the technology is changing and it's affected the industry in a big, big way. Absolutely. Up so, and down. So how do you see, I mean, you, you're, you're young enough, but yet mature enough that you've been able to see the industry change. Mm. What has happened with some of the change? What, what do you see where the industry has changed to and where do you think it's going? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, the industry's changed in, in the sense of how we sell the product. You know, obviously, yeah. it was records and cassettes and CDs, and now all of a sudden, people are streaming. So that's, you know, that's a drastic change in the actual business of the music. So the technology's affected that, and now the laws are catching up to, to compensate the musicians and, and, and producers and songwriters and the artists, obviously, but you do have to learn of, of those streams, learn about those streams of income as a musician, as a songwriter, because you have to like go get it. it. It doesn't just come to you. If you learn about and study it, there's ways to go get money and there's money, there could be money out there for musicians. You know, the neighboring rights, you know, pays musicians for airplay. Hmm. And, and a lot of musicians know about it, but some don't. Yeah, yeah. You know, and there's money out there and they hold it, I think, for a while. So you can, if you study a little bit, you can find, find where it's at. And then obviously, musically, it's, the technology's affected 
in a big way, like we spoke about. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. the musicians is the studios, studio business. Yeah. The musicians, the engineers. Now guys are just learning. Hey, I can run the laptop, do all this myself. Absolutely. Plugins. It's not that hard to to learn. You know how to master it yeah. and how to. I just need a mic. Got to sing it. Besides that, so that was all those people working: the engineer, the assistant, yeah. the studio, the mixer. Yeah. The musicians, I mean, yeah. all those jobs no, this massive have suffered. Change. Yeah. Massive, massive change. So with, with all this change and what's happening, how do you see yourself moving forward? Do you see yourself, you know, still on the road touring? Do you see yourself more in the studio? Do you see a balance of all that? What do you see? I think a balance is good. I'm, I'm signing writers now and producers that, you know, have that, that young energy and I try and keep up with them, but it's a little tough. They start at 10 p.m. and they go till 8 a.m., 10 a.m. and I'm <laughs> really? like, guys, <laughs> At one or two, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> but fusing that, that young energy with some of the experience that we have, it's kind of what Emilio did and, yeah. and Desmond Child and other, you know, they, they, have a, they had a lot of experience and, you know, we all do it in our own way. You know, everybody has their personality and their, and their way of doing things, but that concept of, of, of finding the new music and, and trying to put a touch on it that's unique, yeah. that's always kind of my, my focus when I approach a project is how can it stand out, you know, with, especially now with all this music out, yeah. anybody can put music out. Yeah, yeah. You make a little track, like we said on the computer, you put it out. Yeah, yeah. So Spotify has all this music and there's so much content out there. Yeah. How do you rise above that? How do you poke through, you know, finding something different? So I think it's, you know, finding what's unique in the artist and accentuating that and, and, and doing something unique and that, usually will stand out. Boy, that really sounds fantastic. You know, <laughs> in closing, imagine here now, George, we have all these young musicians that are watching this, they're listening to your voice, mm -hmm. they're, they're influenced by your music and what you're doing and producing and writing. What would you say to this next generation that would give them the, the direction and the hope and the understanding that there's a business out there, mm -hmm. you might have to be involved with several areas of the business, right. but what advice would you give them to this next generation? I would say first, you know, do your 10,000 hours, you know, like they say, because society now is moving really quickly and this instant gratification that, that people feel like, I want this and now we can look it up and get it. Yeah. I wonder, I want to know this, I want to look it up, you know, I want to order this through Amazon, boom, it's there the next day. <laughs> Absolutely. So I think a lot of people when they're young tend to look at, I want to, I want to be a, a singer, or I want to be a producer, or a musician, and they want it right now, I, I want to just get a guitar and I want to be a musician. No, you know, learn your instrument, you know, and learn if it's, if it's producing and study, you know, productions and who did producing and, and do some tracks, you know, and do them yourself. If it's a guitar, I want to learn the guitar and play and play, and get, get, look at your idols and play. You know, I think that's the first step. And then, you know, it depends where your, your path leads you. If you want to be a studio type of guy, you know, learn the different styles, you know, learn jazz, learn blues and you know learn the history and, and yeah. so you can do anything the yeah. best players like we have here Dan Warner and Lee and the, Lee Levin they play anything great they great teach music. you know anything so and if you want to be more of an artist you know find find your path find your own sound find your own voice you know as much as people want to tell you oh do another one of these you know oh that doesn't work we want this is what's hot now you yeah. know yeah. find your own your own sound I think that's what will you know, and that's what I try and bring out in, in the artists when I work with them, you know, so that's the advice <laughs> for the youngsters. <laughs> great, great advice. You know, there's a, a world down here in Miami, which I call Miami World. When it comes to musically, there's a world of yeah. music that's here in Miami yeah. that is infectious. Mm -hmm. It is, it has brought Latin music delivered to the world and to the universe because right. this music will be around forever and ever. Right. And you are a part of creating mm. that wave. You are one of the tsunamis here that's pushing this <laughs> forward. George, thank you so much You're for my being little part. part of the session. Thank Thanks. you so much, Tom. <laughs> Incredible, man.